welcome to another historical fiction author chat. And today I'm welcoming my friend, Rachel McMillan. Hello, Rachel. Hello. Nice to see you. I'm so happy to have you here with me. And we are talking about the Mozart Code today, among other things. This is her yes. new book. Comes out today, March 15. And uh, I, I love it. I'm so excited for you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> this is a great spring for new books. It's yeah. there's so many amazing books coming out, but we'll talk about that after. <laughs> All right. So I will introduce you to Rachel, um, and then we'll get into the book, and then she'll read. Okay, sit back and relax. Rachel McMillan is the author of the Herringford and Watts Mysteries, the Von Buren and DeLuca Mysteries, the Three Quarter Time Series, the London Restoration, and the Mozart Code. So yeah. many books. <laughs> nonfiction, nonfiction works including Dream Plan Go, a travel guide for independent adventure. Very cool. And a very merry holiday movie guide. Rachel lives in Toronto, Canada, and is always reading. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> we have so much to talk about. Rachel is, um, I would say, the most active author on Twitter. She's so supportive of everybody, and it's so neat to, to watch her playing all over social media so we can follow her there. Um, <laughs> now, I'll read the synopsis for the Mozart Code, and I'm a classical musician, you know, so anything yeah. Mozart, near and dear to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, no matter how you might try to hide in a war to escape your past, it is always close at hand. Lady Sophia Huntington Villiers is no stranger to intrigue, as her work with Alan Turing's bomb machines at Bletchley Park during the war attests. Now, as part of Simon Barr's covert team in post-war Vienna, she uses her in inimitable, I can never say that word, <laughs> and codenamed Starling to infiltrate the world of relics, uncovering vital information that could tilt the stakes of the mounting Cold War. When several influential men charge her with finding the death mask of Mozart, Sophie wonders if there's, so if there's more than the composer's legacy at stake, and finds herself drawn to potential answers in Prague. Simon Barrington, the illegitimate heir of one of Sussex's oldest estates, used the previous war to hide his insecurities about his past. Now he uses his high breeding to gain access to all four allied quarters of the ruined city in an attempt to slow the fall of the Iron Curtain. He has been in love with Sophie Villiers since the moment he met her, and a marriage of convenience to save Simon's estate has always kept her close. Until now, when Sophie's mysterious client in Prague forces him to wonder if her allegiance to him and their cause is in question. Torn between his loyalty to his cause and his heart, Simon seeks answers about Sophie only to learn that everything he thought he knew about his involvement in both wars is based on a lie. <laughs> it gives me goosebumps. I love that. <laughs> Wonderful synopsis. All right, so I am going to disappear and mute myself and everybody. Rachel will now read to you from the Mozart Code. Yes. And I am starting at chapter one because I don't want to give too much away. So chapter one, November 1946, Schloss Schönbrunn, Vienna. Simon Barr had left his best revolver back at his family estate near Wilmington, Sussex, along with the Barrington surname. He didn't miss the surname but he did miss the expensive steel of his Webley AMK7 and the smooth curve of its handle. His preference for it was one of the few things he shared with the man who gave him the name he had shrugged off. Now, in the shadow of the moonlight, he could make out the remains of the Baroque Palace's bombed Gloriette, stretching over the depleted shell of once manicured gardens and a fair distance from the twinkling champagne glasses and winking chandeliers of the party he had abandoned. It had taken a bit of time and a rather flirtatious telephone call with his target secretary for Simon to discover that Dieter Hoffer would be here at the party in hopes of procuring the favor of an investor from like-minded individuals in attendance. Before the war, Hoffer Family Industries had been a leviathan of industry, settled amid power plants and near the Aspern airfield. The Nazis had seen to its repurpose for their own munitions gains. Now, the Soviets spread out on the other side of the Danube, their influence creeping into the border between Vienna and Lower Austria. No matter the Hoffer family's political allegiances, their precarious position in the minefield of shifting ideologies made their sudden invest interest in uranium production stand out to the secret intelligence service, given the European interest and fear in atomic warfare. The Americans had not only changed the game of war, but had overseen the shift of the world's greatest threat from Nazi terror 
to the ability to obliterate entire populations with the press of a button. Simon's interest was a matter of deciphering how the Hoffers would exchange information and through what means. Austria had enough academic scientists and curious minds affiliated with the Eternity spy ring committed to pursuing this new war. Simon's leads on Eternity had struck hot the moment he settled in Vienna, but they had begun to slowly dwindle after the June election. The communist shadow loomed large long before the war. Simon was familiar with the movement of the first half of the century when it spilled through the first Austrian Republic. Then, after the first war, when the last of its monarch rule fell and the Social Democrats rose to power, Red Vienna presented many of the similar, similar ideologies that were advancing the Soviet agenda now. The longer Simon divided his time between Vienna and London, the more transient he felt. Even while successfully and covertly continuing the work of his small team, he had been unable to suss out how the ring could be linked to the rise of Soviet influence in the city, in political cabinets, in withholding rations, in unequal treatment of prisoners of war, in the inability to show the same compassion the other Allied counterparts attempted in providing aid from their respective countries. When his target approached, it wasn't hard to follow the man's secretary's description. She had said Simon couldn't miss the younger Hofferson. He wore an eye patch. Simon spared only a moment of sympathy for the man's wartime scars. Hoffer now served his country by aiding eternity a ring of prominent Soviet sympathizers spreading the communist agenda in a far more violent way than in the political arena. A vast difference existed between the atrocities perpetrated by the Red Army as they marched to end the war and those with political idealism that would set the next chapter of the world's history. Simon wasn't precisely sure how Dieter was in eternity or in the business itself. What he did know was how to lure him out to the Gloriette and away from the party. The eternity calling card was the inf- Infinity symbol in mathematics. He'd slipped it in a note to a man presumably part of its elite and small circle of influence. If Hoffer was affiliated with Eternity, the symbol would be an immediate draw. If not, Simon hoped the man's curiosity would draw him anyway. This man was the pawn, and perhaps the game was finally beginning. What would Dieter choose? One or two spaces. Simon had set up the board to start with the front line of his opponents, and he intended to uncover the man's business. I still do not understand why you are so eager to speak to me. Must I spell it out? Simon widened his eyes framed by gold rimmed glasses. He had been told that his eyes were remarkably disarming, apparently to great effect. Well, your family owns a fuel factory in Meidling, does it not? Yeah. In one of the Soviet zones, Simon emphasized. The same Soviet zone that is starving people by stealing their UN rations. And you work at the factory as a general manager. You see to all of the accounting, to the shipping and receiving, to the fact that goods that should be making their way into the hands of the general populace are not. There is no evidence that I, you are being paid, Simon enunciated. You are being paid or there is no other reason you would keep your fellow countrymen from basic human necessities in this drawn and quartered city. Simon drew his regula- regulation issue and field number two from his coat pocket and aimed at the man's chest. I know several of you are complicit. Men you work with, men you never associated with before this bloody war. I want the manifest. He jabbed the man's jacket lapel with the barrel. And if I have that, he thought, maybe I'll know where to start. The man held his hands up and swallowed hard. How do you know that I have a manifest at all? It was quite remarkable the information men inside the party were willing to pass along when they didn't expect Gabe Langer, professor and artifacts enthusiast, to be watching them. Simon utilized Langer to great effect and capitalized on Hoffer being in over his head. Perhaps the man had begged and convinced others he was the perfect person for the job to attend a soiree and exchange information. Simon chose to ignore the man's question. Who are you truly working for? And don't say your father. Herr Barr, surely you can see reason. My reason is this, said Simon. I came to the party with the express purpose of seeking you out. Simon's casual tone belied the intensity of his grip on the revolver. I find you, and then I retrieve what I assume is inside your breast pocket, since you glance down in its direction every 45 seconds. And then he thought, I get one step closer to figuring out how eternity is using this city as much as it did London. Simon narrowed his eyes. That's a rather ill-fitting suit jacket. Droops a little at the collar, far too roomy at the elbow, don't you think? He steadied his hand and pulled the trigger. The bullet shot directly in the path of the man's elbow. 
Simon was rather proud of himself. Charles Barrington always said he was just a little off on his shot, too passionate, too logical, that there needed to be some heart in it. The man skittered over a few feet. You shot me. I shot at you. Simon tucked the revolver back into his jacket pocket and used the man's surprise and distress to approach him. Do you play chess? Well, en passant, if you had taken one step, I wouldn't have shot at you. Two, and you somehow would have avoided your opponent. Simon peeled back the man's lapel and sought the paper therein. Ah, he retrieved the folded manifest. Donka. He tucked the paper into his pocket with flourished aplomb. The man motioned to the graze on his elbow, the clear, the clear tear in his jacket sleeve. You, you shot me, a mere technicality, and your repetition bores me. You're a loathsome, heartless... Stop right there, Simon spoke over Hoffer's last word. You've suffered an egregious loss. He raked his gaze up the man and over to his arm, and there's little your tailor can do about it. Simon straightened his shoulders and turned from the Gloriette back to the Golden Palace. The grounds of Schloss Schönbrunn were Versailles-like in opulence, span and scope, and offered Simon ample opportunity to retrieve his gold cigarette case from behind the manifest he had tucked into his jacket pocket. Leaning against the stone columns underneath the outside staircase, he could see that the great gallery was chaos, erupted with people. With a lighter slid from his cummerbund and the flick of his long fingers, it was but a moment before he pressed the cigarette between his lips. Simon drew in a long length of smoke. The lights from the ground sprawling palace shone over the grass and gardens glimmering from a recent rain. He headed inside and reached for a glass of amber liquid from a passing tray, a scene familiar to him during his 35 years on the planet. He recalled his father's countless insufferable insufferable parties at the family estate in Camden. The music, high-end Schwartz market cigars and bottomless glasses reminded him of long spring nights when Simon strolled around the room, a calm presence to compensate for his half-brother Julius's intoxicated antics, already looking forward to the moment he would escape. This party was to celebrate Viennese industry and the restoration of the economy. Many similar and somewhat vague soirees of the same were held throughout the city, each more glaring contrast to the housing and food shortages in the city. The moment Simon had entered the ballroom, several eyes latched onto him. It wouldn't be the first time his regal posture and expensive tailoring led men to assume he was some dignitary or another. He sartorially met any challenge, and the face Simon Barrington presented to the world was untouchable. His armor, Savile Row, his weapon, his slickly pomaded ebony hair, his shrewd, ethereal blue eyes flashing confidence he didn't always feel. That's not all of chapter one, but it's a bit. Oh, I love that. I love that boy. He, he sounds pretty cool. I love him. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> you're, you're, the dialogue is so cool. It's like, <laughs> you shot me. No, no, I shot at you. I don't know if you've ever seen the, the show Justified. It's, it's I have not. It's more like it's Western. It was, it was older, but he was that kind of smug, kind of <laughs> very cool, very attractive. I got, I got the handle on this. <laughs> I, I have not read the book yet, but I am looking forward to it. I'm excited to read it. It's you know, I don't have the final copy yet, but this is the, uh, you can see the, um, the cover is just gorgeous with Prague in the background. I love it. That's yeah. <laughs> well, you have written so many books. So many yeah. books. <laughs> like all these different series that I was reading. It's amazing. The Herringford and Watts mysteries. I like that because those are set here in Canada, aren't they? In Toronto, in Edwardian era, Toronto. Um, I was going to do Victorian era, but I'm friends with Maureen Jennings, who writes the Murdoch mysteries. And Victorian era, Toronto is very much Murdoch's domain. So I thought Edwardian's a lot of fun. So yeah, yeah that's cool. that is so neat. So how did you how did you move into this one, Mozart Code? How did how did you get inspired to write that one? So it's very interesting because I set out to write historical fiction. And ironically, the book that got me and my agent ah, was a book set during the Halifax explosion Mm -hmm. in 1917, Um, sort of across the tracks romance um, between an Irish immigrant who survived the Titanic. And yeah, it was, but uh, I was told that it was just to Canadian <laughs> for American <laughs> publishers, which you will know. Um, so my agent had been hearing from different publishers that they needed some, and there is an end to this story, but it's really important on how I set this up, uh, that they really wanted more historical mystery. And I just wanted a way into the industry at all. So I thought up a female Sherlock Holmes and her Watson who have to wear trousers and bowler hats to evade 
the morality squad in Toronto. And then Harper Collins uh, called my agent and said, is Rachel McMillan available? We'd like a historical mystery series. So then I, you know, spent a lot of time in Boston and researched the 1930s and wrote two Van Buren and DeLuca series books. And then I was like, is it finally time when I can get back to historical romance? (laughs) Just no mystery, just straight my genre. And so I pitched the London Restoration And while I was writing that book, um, Simon Barrington was kind of a plot point as my heroine's um, liaison with her MI6 work in London, uh, using the architecture of churches to draw out aspiring. And so once I had Simon, I was like, he needs his own book. And I have always been fascinated by the fact that Mozart's death mask showed up in a fan house in a, a pawn shop in Vienna in 1947. I just love that. Like, they're not sure if it's, it's his, I've heard differing theories from Austrian academics. Some believe it is, some believe it. So I was like, how do I tie all this fun stuff together? And there's always music in my books. So Mozart became kind of my bridge to this world. <laughs> love that. I had no idea of that. It's so that's so fascinating. Yeah. Uh, so mostly your heart is with ro- historical romance, <gasps> but this one is like romance and, and spy espionage and yes that's, that's exciting that's a lot more than just your basic historical romance. It, because I really want to always find a way to um and we'll talk about the book industry I think but you always have to have a compelling hook that's going to separate from what else is out there so in a sea of World War II how do I do World War II with a flourish so post-war uh Vienna is my favorite favorite city in the world so how to do that I always say that when you watch a Hallmark Christmas movie the hero might own a Christmas tree farm but that's just his job the center is the romance Simon happens to work for MI6 but (laughs) it basically is my job is to get these two characters together but espionage plays in because it's his day job right so yeah (laughs) um and are all your books, are they all set 18th, 19th century, mostly until until this one in London Restoration? Uh, no, I did 1930s. I did Edwardian. And then this is London Restoration is 1946 with flashbacks. This one is 1946, 47 with flashbacks. So amazing. With all those I, books, do you, <laughs> you ever test yourself? You ever go back and say, okay, name the characters in all of my books. I've tried that. It's hard. It's hard to go. Back I to actually place. really don't. I I find that when I leave characters, I miss them so much. I really do. It's really hard to move on to because I live so much in their world. And during the pandemic, when most of Mozart Code was written and rewritten and rewritten, um, you know, I was basically in Toronto's isolated lockdown. I wasn't seeing anybody. So. Simon and Sophie were my only friends. That sounds very, very scary to people, but it's true. It was like, I, it, the book kept getting really dark um, because it was reflective of that experience and my editor had to keep lightening it. But I, I do find that I keep my characters like little pieces of me that stick on the Velcro <laughs> and just uh, carry them around. <laughs> yeah, I, I know the exact feeling. I miss my as I'm done, I'm thinking, oh, I could have written another chapter. Uh, yeah, <laughs> where did they go? <laughs> um, so do you always know your stories? Are you a plotter or a pantser? Do you know I'm a pantser. Um, with something like Mozart Code, because there has to be like uh, really there has to be a bit of a mystery and a bit of a what is at the heart of this. So I had to know major moments that happen, but I always allow myself um, opportunities to fall down rabbit holes that usually come from further research. Like I really want to always throw in everything that I've learned because history is so fascinating. Um, But the one thing I usually have is the characters do sit down on my brain and I can hear their voices. I can see them perfectly. Um, I always have the character in the setting first. You can see them exactly. Oh, yeah. I know that not everybody and I can hear them. And it's funny because a lot of writers say I can't get the and I'm like, yeah, I can hear them. (laughs) 
Right. <laughs> and you can tell that from that dialogue, that little piece you just read. You can oh. totally hear Simon's voice there. That was, that was great. Have you always wanted to be a writer? Yes. Um, and I was too nervous to show anyone my writing until uh, I guess it was 2014 when I first got my agent. I had been writing forever. Um, so the first person who actually saw my writing was my now agent. Uh, I, I never had any critique partners. I was too, and it was really me thinking, if you don't do this, you're going to regret it. But it was also me thinking if it bombs, you just go back to writing for yourself. Um, which I did for a long time. I mean, writing is something I truly enjoy and the publishing world makes it different because it's a business first. Uh, but yeah, I, and, uh, but first and foremost, I, I say I'm a, a, just a book lover in general. And I love the way you said that about writing because so many people I find when they, when they want to write, they've got sort of two main reasons why they're not writing. You know, I've, I've met yeah. so many people that say, I'm, I want to write a book too. I'd love to be a writer. And so I say, why don't you? And they're usually it's, I just don't have enough time, which yeah. I pretty much think you can always find five minutes in a day. And Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. the other is maybe people won't like it. And my answer is the same as what, what you said is, you know, if they don't like it, you're writing for you. It doesn't really matter yeah. who else is loving it. But you've gone beyond the author world. <laughs> you have entered into a whole world that is mysterious to me. Uh, Rachel is a, a literary agent. So I yeah. want to hear all about that. How did you well, get into it? And what is it? What are you, what are you doing behind the scenes? What do I do? So <laughs> I, I got into it because um, I was downsized from my job of 11 years where I worked in educational publishing um, for a Canadian company called Nelson. And I really didn't know what I wanted to do next, but my post-grad work is in book publishing. My, I worked all through university in indie bookstores at the world's biggest bookstore. Like I've always been in books and I really was at a crossroads. Like what part of publishing do I work in? I started selling more of my own stuff. So I thought it would be great if I could find something that still allows me to have time to do all my own stuff. And Within the span of about two weeks, I had emails from at least six different people saying, if you ever go into agenting, let me know. And I was like, it, I, I hadn't even thought about it. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized how it could fit in well with my writing, how the two worlds, oh, yeah. I mean, I decide how many clients I have the ebbs and flows of sometimes it's just maintenance. I mean, all my clients right now are signed, which means that I'm just checking over, is the title okay in the titling meeting? Um, so after that, I, I reached out to um, my agent and he happened to have an opening in his agency. I knew I didn't want to go solo. Uh, and for about three months, he I went to what I call agent school, where we worked every day on my learning contracts. But the one thing I already had as a book lover was editorial connections. So, okay, for everybody watching, we just had a little bit of an internet crash, so I'm editing it out. But let's get back to what you were talking about. <laughs> um, how did you get into this? You were like, you all your connections, all the people you knew, just writers, yeah. editors, and publishers. And just knowing the, uh, being a voracious reader gives me an up on this because I always have comp titles and I always know what's coming out. So I do think that it's a very tough job, but it's one my background prepared me for because I was always a bookseller and I was in sales and marketing and sat at um, committee level for in my educational publishing job. I kind of got all of that. But from the author side, I know all the intricacies and highs and lows of what it feels like to get a rejection or to have a book release and get that terrible trade review. It allows me a bit of empathy, I think, that a lot of people don't have because I really have seen it from both sides. Yes. So I, that has been an unexpected advantage. So you have to be a bit of a, a, bit of a psychologist too. Um, I don't know if people realize <laughs> what an emotional journey it is to put a book out because um, I've put out a bunch and every single time I do it, I'm terrified. And I, you know, I know I'm waiting for the first review thinking they're all going to hate it. And, and the, the waiting in general between 
an offer and a contract. Everything about this is silence and telling authors, no, you haven't heard in two weeks. This is normal. We never hear anything. (laughs) Um, And a lot of it is honestly, a lot of the job is um, savvy about the industry, but also instinct. Right. Because you are responsible for someone's career. Yeah, and, and every and their and their emotions and their feelings because it is such a um, these books are our babies. It matters so much. So your initial thing, just so people understand, your initial thing once you uh, hear from an author um, is you um, mm-hmm. you need to find someone who can represent them, and so it goes from yeah. there, right? You just have to figure out how they match. And well, no, I I have to decide they query me and say this is my book and I have to decide if I'm going to be the best champion for that book right so if anyone is querying agents and you're nervous about getting rejections remember that we have to think I am taking this entire this person's entire dreams and hopes and career on my shoulders if I am not the right person for that book then I'm doing them a disservice I also have to have at least eight editors in mind that I know will open and love the manuscript. I am a single woman. I don't have time to collect a bunch of books I can't sell. I need to eat and live. (laughs) So (laughs) um, a lot of it is, it's often I tell writers, if you get rejections from agents, it's not that you're a bad writer. Sometimes I have to pass on things I really love just because I can't foresee selling it quickly or there's something too comparable in the marketplace it's all about finding the gaps in the industry so that a book stands out because there are a million books out there a million historical books out there Um, and from then it's basically being everything from editor to marketing manager for authors and being the liaison in an author says, I hate my cover, or they did this wrong. It's me being diplomacy, Rachel, and working between the two parties. That is So it's a lot of fun, but it's a lot of a challenge. That is tough, because uh, they they sure know what they want. So, you know, publishers, they they have a plan, and they're going with that. So good for you. That's that's tough. (laughs) But you get to go back to your first love, which was writing, and... uh, Yes. Um, and so have you got another book planned? You always do, right? We always have. Um, yeah. So I have two books coming out in 1940s occupied France. Um, so it's just an updating of that story, which was a lot of fun to do. I've always wanted to retell a classic. And then I have a collaborative novel with Amy Runyon and Janelle Sazelski called The Castle Keepers, which comes out in March of next year. And it takes readers into an estate called Leedswick in Northumberland across three wars. And so the final part is where you meet my characters, and that is in the post-war so it deals with Freud and uh, shell shock and the estate is now worked as a restorative place for men to come and heal before going back into society oh, so it's yeah. it's a need to work with two other authors yeah so that's what's next I thought you know this you're always percolating the books beyond those so I'm always thinking ahead but those are the start coming those two are the next that are coming out for sure that's amazing. I can't wait. And, and that, I, I've never written with someone and, and I'd like to try that someday, but um, that, that sounds really exciting. So I'm really excited for the Mozart Code. I'm really excited that I was able oh, to uh, bring you here today, everybody. This is another amazing Canadian author. So you should uh, make sure that you have this one on your bookshelves. We are all supporting <laughs> local here. Um, thank you again, Rachel, so much for coming. Oh, you're so welcome. Sorry about the silly internet. You know, it's, uh, you never know. It happens. And we're in another snowstorm today. So I just think it's the weather. I just blame everything on the weather. Exactly. (laughs) Well, thank you again so much and all the best with your book. Thank you. Thank you, Genevieve. Thanks, everybody.